Hello, everyone. Can you hear us okay? Hello, hello. Happy Friday. Happy Hidden Hour. I'm here with the Dr. John Mathias, forensic psychologist, criminal psychologist. We are going to talk profiling tonight. Hit the like and subscribe button for those that want to ask their live questions in chat. This is a very special opportunity for someone to not just be profiling this crime of the Moscow, Idaho for uh, the homicides there, but to the in opportunity to ask your questions. So hit subscribe so you can join the chat and ask all of your questions. We're going to dig right in because there is a lot to talk about, isn't there? Uh, Dr. John, for those new to our channel, I'm calling him Dr. John Mathias, but he's also my husband. So I might slip up and call him babe. It happens from time to time, but we are married and uh, I am, I was a TV journalist uh, for 10 years. So we are a forensic psychologist and journalist uh, co host to this. So thank you everyone for joining us. Let your friends know about us. Uh, let anyone that has questions about this crime, this awful tragedy to uh, join us tonight. And we'll, we'll get to it, Dr. John. Uh, first off, I, I want to actually ask what is profiling, if that's an okay way to start? Yeah, I think I think we should start with that. If we're going to talk about it, let's define it. So um, profiling is basically trying to develop uh, a picture of a suspect or suspects in a criminal case. There's there's the kind of profiling that I do. It's called psychological profiling. Psychological profiling works with a known suspect. So in other words, most all my work occurs with somebody who's been convicted of a crime or they're in the process of going to trial or the, the suspect is known. They're caught. They can be evaluated in full because we know who they are. We can talk to collateral parties or people they know to find out more about them. So psychological profiling is it's also sometimes called uh, evaluations. But let's use the term psychological profiling. Essentially, a psychological profile, most of what I do is risk assessment, which means that we know the suspect, the suspect is usually in the judicial process, and my job is to evaluate risk or sometimes competency or sometimes sanity or insanity, depending on what the lawyers believe is appropriate for the circumstance. So that's psychological profiling. It's the main distinction there is the suspect is known. Suspect suspect based profiling is different in the sense that the suspect is unknown. That's and that's a huge distinction. So the goal of suspect based profiling is to identify the psychological and behavioral features of people who may may commit a particular crime. So in other words, you're using largely using research on particular crimes to figure out who a suspect might be. So you're looking at, for example, with somebody who's stalking, for example. Let's say we don't know who the stalker is. So we want to look at some of the research and some of the empirical evidence that, that points us in the direction of what a stalker looks like. What are the typical average characteristics of a stalker? Do those seem to apply in a particular case, right? So, so suspect profiling looks at very particular crimes, let's say stalking, terrorists, burglars, right? Uh, um, it looks at a different subset of different crimes and it, it tries to develop a profile to learn about a potential suspect or identify a particular suspect based upon the psychological and behavior characteristics of the research. And then there's another type of profile. There, and actually, this isn't universally agreed upon. There's some dispute about different types of profiling. So let me mention that. But crime scene profiling is another type of profiling. And that's quite simple. It's looking at the characteristics of a crime scene and trying to make inferences about the psychological traits or behavioral characteristics of a criminal. So in this particular, in the, in the, Idaho murders, I think there's there's probably a combination of suspect profiling and crime scene profiling going on. Often those two go together. But one 
suspect profiling usually is looking more at the research and crime scene profiling is looking at the characteristics of the crime scene and the specific specifics of the crime scene and trying to make inferences and conclusions based on that about who the suspect might be and who committed the crime. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. But that oh, let, me, let me just say, let me say a few things about crime scene profiling too. So anybody who's watched the H, the uh, Netflix show Mindhunter or read any of the work of John Douglas would know some of these terms quite well, which back in the seventies, when the behavioral analysis unit, was starting to figure out crime scene profiling, they came up with this distinction between what they called an organized crime scene and a disorganized crime scene. And the belief was that the organized crime scene was a, a killer who was fairly meticulous and it was planned and premeditated and a disorganized crime scene would have been one that was disheveled and typically the, the killer would be considered to be more impulsive and reactive, and the crime scene was more of a mess. Turns out over the years, this was like in the 70s, that was a very helpful distinction, by the way, back in the 70s when this was going on. And in and, and that show Mindhunter, which is actually based on the work of John Douglas on Netflix, that they talk a lot about those different types of crime scenes. But it turns out that most crime scenes are a combination. They're what we call mixed. So most crime scenes are somewhat organized, somewhat disorganized. It's rare to get one or the other, although it does happen. Somebody that commits a crime at the last moment impulsively is clearly going to leave a mess. The crime scene is going to be a disaster. And, you know, it's easier to assign a label of disorganized in those cases. So, and you have other distinctions, by the way, in crime scenes. You have staged crime scenes. Those would be organized you have crime scenes that are involve what we call undoing, which is that the perpetrator attempts to whitewash the scene, right? This is where you get bleach and you get all kinds of, you, you get an attempt essentially to cover up the crime scene. Again, that would be more of an organized scene. Those would be scenes, by the way, where the murderer perceives that they have time to do that. If you think about the Moscow murders, my guess is that time was of the essence. The person wanted to get in and out, which, by the way, is interesting why they would use a knife. A gun would be much more efficient. Um, and that speaks to the use of a knife would speak to potentially the murderer knowing the victim or wanting to exact some type of revenge. And a knife would be a much more intimate way to kill someone. You have to be in close proximity to the person that you're harming, right? It's you're you're literally taking the life out of them and you're seeing that. And so with a gun, you can be at a distance, it's much more impersonal. So turns out most crime scenes tend to be mixed, some combination of organized and disorganized. My guess is that in Moscow, that's, that's probably what you have. Uh, for those, the, the sound is not sinking. John's voice is oh. not synced for me either, but it's working. Don't, don't change anything, John, because I think it's just a, a lapse and we can still hear. So uh, I don't want to mess that up. I don't know if, my voice is sinking for you or not, but hopefully it'll get better. Uh, we Your voice worry. is fine. I notice I'm lagging. It seems like my picture's lagging a little bit, the video. Yeah, it is. So I okay. apologize uh, to everyone, but as long as everyone can hear, that's what's most important. It's annoying, but you know, <laughs> we can still hear. So. Right. It's like watching an old school video, like uh, where they're dubbing over the voices. Right. Pretend this isn't a different language and we're just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. It might be an internet connection. True. So, uh, John, there, we're getting a ton of great questions. I'm trying okay. to keep up. Thank yeah. you, everyone. But uh, before we get to those, I just want to ask you, because we were talking earlier today uh, with a producer about some of your thoughts uh, when it came to the difference of this crime, like a lot of people are saying serial killer, is this a serial mm -hmm. killer? And you, yeah. you have said to me, no, I would not define this as a serial killer, which was confusing to me at first, because I'm like, what are you talking about? Four people, a giant knife. I mean, this weapon has been talked about so much, a giant knife yeah. that this person was clearly proud of. These were not <laughs> puncture wounds, according to the coroner. Um, what can you tell us about that? 
you said, no, listen, this isn't a serial killer. This is something else. Yeah. So let, let's talk about some definitions there. So broadly speaking, we sometimes talk about what are called rampage killings. Rampage killings are killings that involve sh like school shootings, workplace shootings. They involve what we call mass murders or mass murderers. A mass murder, by definition, is four or more victims at the same location. Another type of a rampage shooting or killer would be what we call spree killings. Spree killings are typically defined as three or more victims at multiple locations. So three or more victims at two or more locations. And with spree killings and with mass murders, criminologists sometimes use the term cooling off period. That, In other words, with, this, with a mass murderer, like the shooting in Las Vegas at the, at the uh, music festival several years ago, the, the, the murders all occurred in one location at one time. That's a mass murderer, and it's a mass murder scene. A spree killing would be someone who kills some people at one location, then moves to another location, then moves to another location, but there's no cooling off period. So there's no time lapse. A serial killer, on the other hand, is someone who usually targets one individual at a time. Not always, like Ted Bundy, we be the exception, but so somebody like Dahmer targeted one, indiv one individual at a time, and there were significant cooling off periods. So the cooling off period or the lapse in time is what distinguishes, and I think in this particular case, what distinguishes what makes the crime scene more of a mass murder rather than a serial killer. So also with a serial killer, I mean, it's a little confusing. It's possible that it's possible this person has killed before. There does seem to be some degree of efficiency at the crime scene. And that maybe implies that the person may have been responsible for previous murders. So maybe, maybe there have been other victims and that would put it in the category of a serial killer. So you'd have a serial killer kind of like Bundy who sometimes killed one person, sometimes killed couples, sometimes killed, like at the Florida State dorms, killed a group of people. Maybe it's like that. That would be a huge concern. Um, but in general, if we, if we assume that this is a one-off type crime and there's four victims, then that would kind of fall into the realm of mass murder. I can't, I can't. Sorry, I had it on mute. Okay. Thank you. And then okay. I forgot to take it off. Okay. You, you brought up something about whether this person has killed before or the question of that. That brings me to a question from uh, Kavita Diva. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a little bit ago, so I can't find it to pin it, but I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, a forensic detective that she listened to said that this could have never been done by an amateur. So their question is, and I don't know who that forensic detective is. I don't think that they're on the case. It's somebody that's discussing yeah. it. Here it is. Here it is. Question. I heard from a forensic detective that it could have been done by an amateur, that this was planned out and done by someone who is skilled. Your opinion, please. I think that's a big leap. I think that somebody who knew this home and was angry enough and had enough rage could have carried it out without a lot of planning. So I, I don't totally agree with that. I don't know if, if you're going to, if I'm going to make that statement, I want to back it up with evidence. I mean, it's, it's assuming access to this house is fairly simple and assuming the person was angry enough. I, I think it could have been carried out by someone who didn't plan it. I don't, I just, I, I just don't, I, I don't know. I, I dispute that. I think that also it makes me a little nervous whenever someone says never, right? It could never have been. I mean, no, nope, that's, if, if you're in crime long enough, there's, there's no such thing as a never. So, um, so I, I, I tend to disagree. I think it could have been carried out impulsively. I think it would have been more difficult and again, I, you know, to make that claim without knowing all the evidence, that's that's tricky. I think right. there's so much we don't know, right? I, I, it it could have sure it could have been planned. I don't, but the police don't. They have not released enough information to really make that assessment. So to say something like that, I think, is overstating the case. 
I also want to point out that they can be skilled in other ways. They can be skilled in military. They can be skilled in hunting. Right. They can be skilled in strength. Yeah. One thing, and we'll get to profiling this specific killer in a, in a little bit. Stay tuned, everyone. But one thing that you have said is that this person had a lot of strength. They were yeah. strong. So there are right. ways that they can be skilled uh, that makes them maybe not an amateur, but that still doesn't mean they've done something that's horrendous before and have had other murder victims. Is yeah, that a fair I, way to say it? I think if I were to create a suspect-based profile, which we just talked about, or a crime, even a crime scene profile, where we understand the knife being a large knife and a death, obviously a lethal knife, I think I would probably consider that the perpetrator was somewhat athletic, was fairly agile, was able to get in and out quickly in some cases. And we could be wrong about this, but we've heard that in some cases, the murder, the, the actual deaths occurred with one plunge of the knife, right? That it was quick. And that the person, obviously, if you're going to kill someone with one stab, you're going to have to have a certain amount of strength. And so... And let me clarify that. We know that the victims had several stab wounds, that this was bloody. Yeah. What, what Dr. John is referring to is a coroner interview with Ashley Banfield on News Nation. For those that haven't seen that, I recommend it. We, we have it on our Twitter um, as well as, where else did we put it? But we have shared that on our social media. The coroner then says, I wouldn't call these puncture wounds. And she said that the victims died the similar way. One one stab to the chest area. I, I'm not quoting verbatim, but that's essentially what she referred to as the chest area, one stab. So that's what you're talking about when they all, um, you know, the, the one kill stab. And that so was, there, there was, there was one fatal blow. There may have been multiple punctures or multiple stabs, but there was for each one of them, there seemed to have been one fatal blow. Which, Correct. And according to the coroner to Ashley Banfield, which would require so with strength. With a large knife to pull that off, I think it requires a certain amount of strength. I wouldn't be surprised if, again, if we're developing a suspect-based profile, I would perceive potentially this person as being somewhat athletic, somewhat agile, somewhat strong. They might have a past history of sports involvement. They, prob they might have some involvement in the military to know how to use a knife this way, maybe or ROTC. Or hunting, it's Idaho. What? Or hunting, it's Idaho. Right, hunting, yeah, hunting, like basic training in the military. Right, hunting for sure. I know there was one suspect that a lot of internet folks were looking at who, who clearly had some skill in hunting and with a knife. And so I, I think that would be part of this profile is is – someone fairly athletic and someone who had some involvement maybe in the military, even if it was like ROTC in, in high school. So if you consider that the suspect is young, say a young college student, probably a young male, then you'd have to go towards maybe something like ROTC or maybe somebody who joined the military at a young age, 18-ish, basic training, maybe Marines, something like that. People are asking, they're saying that the coroner really said this. I'll see if I can in just a little bit pull up the Ashley Banfield interview. I know we were going to share it last time and, and we did it. But yes, the coroner stated this to News Nation in, in a very telling interview. It was it was in the first week. Um, and it's an interview that got buried, I think, with all of the news, but a, a very important one. Other things we know about the, less, uh, about the weapon, uh, according to Kaylee's father to ABC News, he stated that detectives told him, this is Steve, that this was a weapon that the killer would have been very proud of, uh, that it was large and that it was, um, you know, that this was also a lot about this, this weapon. Uh, this is not your average knife, in other words. When I hear that, by the way, like, I don't want to get too far into this, but when you, when you say that, it sounds so Freudian, right? Like, he's proud of his, proud of his knife. Right. And that's not even you being completely funny. That's you actually. And, and while that sounds funny and it's funny, but that there's actually legitimate. What you're saying is if this was a angry, rejected yeah. male, there actually some, is something to that. Well, it, it, I mean, not, not to get into this too much because YouTube won't be happy with us, but 
uh, and, and you remind me that we, we want to try to monetize these things, um, against my better instincts, right? Sometimes I want to talk about the, the crazier stuff, but the, right. The, you know, the, the old Freudian thing about what's a cigar, what does a cigar symbolize, right? What, what's a knife? What does a knife symbolize? I mean, in some very real sense, a knife symbolizes power and by overwhelming a, f- a number of female victims, obviously there's one male victim, but it, it's it's symbolic. I think there's some, I don't know how else to put it. I think there's definitely some phallic implications there. Yeah. And someone who at least based on that, you'd have to question their, their perception of their masculinity. In other and words, it have doesn't to- have to be um, a sexual assault. No. Although, although that, although this, we talked about this last week, although I think that could add that type of component. I think that could add this kind of erotic component. People said, well, there was no sexual assault. So doesn't that mean that this wasn't any type of a sex crime? No, not necessarily. This is someone who could have fantasized about one of the victims in that way for a very long time, or at least some time, but knew that he probably couldn't get away with a sexual assault in time because there were a number of people in the building. So the fantasy was there prob- potentially, but the action wouldn't have shown that. Thank you. Yes, exactly. In fact, there's, there's a lot of murder. The, the number of murders that have sort of that erotic component are you'd be, it's amazing. Like it, you, it seems on the surface it's just a it's just a murder and involves something to do with revenge or power. But if you look a little deeper, or if you have a chance, to, you know, when suspects are known, like in the cases where I get involved, there's quite often that other component that that comes into play that's not obvious. I want to thank Dal Pace and then Haley Manigal. This is her first donation to a channel. We're, we're beyond honored for that. And also, thank you to Julie. That means so much to us. Johnny I want to Shepherd. thank Dal too. Dal's, Dal's been with us a long time. Thanks, Dal. We really appreciate yeah. you. We appreciate all of our, our hidden gems so much. Yeah. Johnny Shepard is also bringing up something important. I can't figure out how the perp could be stabbing one and not wake up the other in the room because we do realize that Haley, or excuse me, Haley, who's just who donated. Thank you, Haley, for donating. We realize that Maddie and Kaylee were in the same bed and then Zanna and Ethan were allegedly, we assume, in the same bed. And I think that also goes to show that there was one fatal blow. Uh, Kaylee's father has also said on national television that he believed they didn't suffer, that it was quick. That would also go to evidence that there was one fatal blow in the heart. And in that sense, this person killer did know how to kill. That doesn't necessarily mean he's done this before. Well, also in answering this question, it appears that Maddie and Kaylee were sleeping in the same bed. And it right, and we also it, it also appears that Zana and Ethan were sleeping in the same bed. So I think it, it's more likely that you're going to avoid waking up someone if you're in the same bed. In other words, with a certain amount of efficiency and speed and rage, this killer can avoid that issue of waking someone up because they're in the same bed. In other words, he attacks them both in the same location at the same time. So we right. avoid the screams because he carries out the murders with such efficiency. Uh, Neri, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, they ask a great question. Uh, leaving the pet unharmed could be significant with a question mark, even to point that they were involved or, rela- uh, uh, or related. I'll answer that uh, or my thoughts. You know, Murphy, the, the Labradoodle that was that belonged to both Kaylee and her on and off again boyfriend Jack. He, uh, Murphy is safe and he is with Jack now. You know, we've heard a lot of, uh, there's there's been a lot of talk about how Murphy was not harmed. That is fact. But there have been people saying that he didn't bark at all. There have been people saying, no, this dog was barking for hours afterwards. There have been people saying, why didn't the dog bark? He clearly knew the person. <laughs> and, and then there are the people that have been saying, well, no, my Labradoodle never barks. It's a terrible watchdog. 
that doesn't necessarily know they knew the person. I think the one thing we can gather from Murphy being unharmed is that the dog was not the target and the dog was not a threat because if the dog had been a threat, the dog would have been killed. And right. I think that's what we can gather from Murphy being unharmed or the only thing right now that we can gather from that. Yeah, I think that, right. That's, that's the most important point. Whether the dog was barking or not is irrelevant. What's relevant is, I mean, it could be relevant, but I don't think you can make the inference that the dog's not barking because it knows the person. Either way, the murderer didn't perceive the dog as a threat. Otherwise, the dog would have been murdered, I'm sure, or killed. That's the main issue. I think that for whatever reasons, the murderer ignored the dog, didn't think it was a threat, thought he thought he could get in and out without concern. The dog obviously wasn't going to talk about the crime. So, um, so yeah, I think it's an issue of threat. It's not an issue of whether he knew the person or not. It, it, none of that really mattered. This is some guy who's trying to get in and kill people or at least one person. Right. You can call me patches. Thank you so much for your donation and your compliment. And I want to say patches also known as Patricia was on news nation last night. Uh, we uh, encouraged her to ask a question she was interested in. News Nation's done a great job covering this case. And uh, Patches, thank you for helping them do that. I, I am, we appreciate how News Nation has really embraced um, the excellent uh, and skilled true crime sleuths out there. I think they've done a great job reporting on this. Thank you, Patches, so much. Yeah, thank you, Patches. Um, so, so some other questions. Let's talk about... Let's go back to profiling the killer a little bit. Okay. Uh, you've discussed some things. A lot of people are asking the same question in different ways. So, okay. so a question that a lot of people are asking, do you think that there was one target? Do you think the house was a target? And I think this question is very relevant right now because police have kind of walked back some things. They have stated early on that one person was targeted, that there was a target, and we won't tell you who that person is. Then we heard that there was no target and that the house was possibly a target. This has gone back and forth quite a bit. Uh, December 1st, their statement defense, December 1st. Let me see if I can pull it up and I will read it because this is such uh, contested, you know, a hot topic. I think I want to read it as, as of yesterday, straight from police. Here's their statement. Moscow homicide update, December 1st, 2022. We remain consistent in our belief that this was a targeted attack, but investigators have not included if the target was the residents or if it was the occupants. Can we talk about that for a bit? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's such an important distinction. If a specific person, if a specific victim was targeted, I think that makes this case easier to solve in the sense that clearly you can infer that it was somebody in that person's orbit or presumably that the victim probably knew the person to some degree or had some interaction with the person. If the house was targeted, I think that changes things quite a bit. So it's interesting to think about this in terms of a mass murder because oftentimes mass murderers. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't know for, for our audience, I'm not sure if you guys remember Elliot Roger, but he was an incel who actually lived in a dorm. He was going to community college in Santa Barbara and he went on a spree. He, I forget this was in like 2014. He went on a spree rampage where he, I don't, he killed a lot of people, but Santa Barbara, California, for those. Yeah. Of Santa Barbara, California, the, the, the killings began in his dorm room. He actually used a knife to murder three of his roommates. And that's where it began. And then he took a gun and went out and, and targeted some sorority girls. But he, his goal was revenge. And he detested, he wasn't able to become a part of the sorority and fraternity world that he wanted to be. And he had a lot of rage he felt like he didn't fit in. He felt emasculated by a lot of the women in some of the sororities. And his plan initially was to attack a sorority and to get revenge and uh, for 
the fact that he was being rejected by a lot of these fraternity, for, uh, sorority women. And so I think there's some similarities here in the sense that there's something we call murder by proxy, which is you're not targeting a specific individual. In other words, let's say that Kaylee was, was a target. Um, or I'm sorry, let me, let me back up on that. That these, some of these women were members of a sorority, right? And so murder by proxy is you're not targeting a specific victim like Kaylee or Maddie. You're actually targeting the group that they represent. So it's by proxy. In other words, you hate sorority women because they've rejected you. So you don't know the specific people in that building or in that house. You don't know Kaylee or Maddie, but you hate all that they represent. And so murder by proxy is you target the home because you know there's some women in there that you dislike, that maybe have rejected you. You intensely despise what they stand for. So you go in and murder them all and you see that as some type of revenge. That's essentially what Elliot Roger did. Correct. And so I, th I think you have, you potentially, it's interesting that they walk this back because maybe that's what they're saying. Maybe they're seeing this as murder by proxy now rather than, because there is such a huge difference. If let's say Kaylee, I think Kaylee would be the most logical person that would have been a target based on what we know. If Kaylee is not a target, that changes everything. And now you move to, if it's again, it's still a mass murder. Now you're moving to seeing this as some type of revenge, but maybe not revenge against a specific individual, maybe revenge against what the women in the, in the house or sororities represent to the person doing the killings. And to Rogers, they represented everything he couldn't have. Let's, let's fact, further that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, fact, you did bring I have, up. I have a quote. This is a quote from Elliot Roger. Um, he wrote a manifesto and by this manifesto is not widely available for reasons that would be, I think, fairly clear in the sense that you wouldn't want it. it it's a, it's a startlingly hateful manifesto. And so I think it's not published because people recognize that it, this could do some real damage if it was in the wrong hands. But parts of it were, it was published for a while. Some of it's available. People have written books about Roger, not a lot, but. If you looked anyway. hard, I'm sure you could find it, but on the, on the basic Google search, it's not. Yeah. The last time I checked, it wasn't available on Amazon. I think there was a moment when it was published, but anyway, this is a quote from, Elliot Roger and his manifesto before he went on his killing spree, he said, quote, there's a lot of quotes in there, by the way, that are real. If you want to get inside the mind of a mass murderer, this manifesto is a really good way to do that. He says, quote, all of those popular people who live hedonistic lives of pleasure, I will destroy because they never accepted me as one of them. I will make them suffer just as they made me suffer. There you go. That's the type of that's the type of thinking he was engaged in prior to his murders. And so I would imagine, I could imagine that the murderer in this case could say something similar to that. Right. Right. And and again, he was an incel, and this is that type of person or looks to be that type of person. You know, with that being said, let's go further. You said something that uh, a lot of people are jumping on, and I think it's time to discuss that. You said, if there is a one single target, it's most likely Kaylee. I see people mentioning that Maddie and Deanna work together at Mad Greek. I know that um, one of our, our close friends is determined that Ethan is the target, likely the target, because he wasn't always there, and he was at the frat party. Um, tell us why you think that if a person was targeted, you suspect it's most likely Kaylee, unless you want me to talk about that. But I, I think the first, my first line of argument would be that she was single. On and, and off again, boyfriend with Jack, but she was single true. at this point. Mm -hmm. She was single. She had returned to the house for the weekend 
so p- potentially someone knew that. And I, if you're just going to go, so my guess is that entry occurred on the second floor. If Ethan's the target, why go to the third floor and kill other people? Right. He could the, the killer just could have gone into the second floor, killed Ethan. Ethan happened to be with Santa, maybe killed them both if he didn't want a witness, and then left. Mission accomplished. But the killer goes to the third floor. The killer goes to the third floor for a reason. So I think that would suggest Maddie or Kaylee. And, the, and in a process of elimination, Kaylee was known to have a stalker or stalkers. That hasn't been proven. But there's that, that there seems to be, she was single. So it's not hard for me to imagine Kaylee showing up at a sorority party or maybe a bar and she's not with a boyfriend. Perhaps Maddie is. Somebody approaches her and tries to talk to her. And essentially she says to the person, get lost, creep. She or shuts something him like that. Yeah. Right. And, and we don't know saying, what Kaylee would say, but right. Something. Yeah. I, right. I don't, you know, something, just any type of rejection, I think would be enough to start triggering something in the, with the wrong person. I mean, and that's frightening, right? Because that type of thing happens all the time on college campuses. So, but to the wrong person at the wrong time, some type of rejection, I could see this person ruminating for a long time over that type of comment, it would have been a comment that Kaylee wouldn't have even remembered. It would have been a comment that Kaylee probably, she probably wouldn't have even recalled it. Right. But, but to the wrong person, to an Elliot Roger type guy who is a bit of a narcissist or maybe more than a bit of a narcissist. Yeah. Psychopath. Right. Yeah. To, to the wrong person, it could send in motion a chain of events. It could be a triggering incident that could set off a chain of events leading to this type of murder. Yes. So in other words, uh, either again, this residence, the house was targeted for what it stood for and what it represented or a female in the house was targeted is your, is your opinion. And people are bringing up Xana. We understand that her mother, uh, was arrested shortly after on drug yeah. charges. We, we have discussed that, but again, we go to, uh, why this killer, uh, what the killer's motives were. And we see it more than drugs or something like that as, as a rejected male still. Right. We talked a little last week about this, the, uh, Napa Valley murders in 2004 that had similar characteristics. There were, two roommates that were murdered and there was no suspect identified for a long time, several years or over a year. And there was a lot of fear in the community and there was a lot of uncertainty and there were no suspects being identified. So people were going to conspiracies like this was a mob related hit, or this was a cartel hit, or this was, they're going people, I think in the absence of a lot of information, which is occurring here and a lot of fear, you're going to generate more conspiracies. You're going to, it's going to create more, it's going to create more misinformation, I think. So that's not to say that, I mean, is it possible there be, could be a connection there? Yeah, it's possible. Sure. I think they need to rule it out. Do I think it's probable or the most likely scenario? No, I think you'd have to look at, for me, again, profiles are based on averages. You'd have to look at a suspect who's probably a male. And not, not a cartel. Thank you. Cordy is asking a good question. And for those that have asked questions earlier, I do want to say that I have some uh, questions uh, stored here that we're going to get to. Uh, but Cordy is asking if this is a rejected male, as you suspect, an incel, will they do this again? If not well, caught. Yeah. Let me clarify. I don't, I don't know for sure it's an incel. I'm just saying that I think it, there's some characteristics that are, it looks to me like that type of crime. An incel would be an extreme example. So incel, by the way, stands for involuntary, involuntary celibate, meaning that typically incels are younger males who are having trouble developing relationships or finding 
partners, they feel rejected. And essentially they're what they do based on that is to blame women for their problems. So their argument is misogyny in other words. Yeah, it's right. It's, it's, it's right. It's a form of misogyny for sure. <clears throat> so there's, do I think if I were developing a profile here, would I say there's misogyny? Yeah, probably. Would I go so far as an insult? I don't know. I'm, I just, I point out that example because it seems to resonate. Thank you. So what the question, what was the question again? So uh, Cordy asked if, if this is mm -hmm. a rejected male or an incel yeah. or a misogynist and they're not caught, will they do this again? I, I think you'd have to be concerned about it for sure. I think they probably would take this some time to regroup. But the thing about like, so this, the thing that's interesting about mass murderers is they want attention. That a lot of times mass murderers, and this was true of, so this was true of Elliot Roger. Elliot Roger left a manifesto because he wanted the world to know who he was and what he did. He wanted recognition. And I think the risk here, so this was carried this was carried out late at night and there was no stage for the world to see. I mean, obviously the world's talking about it, but, and, and I'm sure that the murderer is, is probably finding that, you know, is, is, is probably, I don't know how else to put this, but is probably enjoying that. And so it's probably paying attention to all the media for sure. But I, I definitely think there's some risk that you might, somebody like this might want to at some point, have more of a public presence and get on the more of a public stage and receive the recognition that they think they deserve for being rejected for all the things that Roger complained about. Thank you to, to someone up here that said uh, that incels are just women who are angry at, at men. It makes no sense. I know, I know plenty of men who have self-proclaimed themselves as, as incel. So I, I actually disagree with that. Here's a question that I think is a great one. I want to thank Dove. Marshall too, by the way, for the, the kind comments here. So thank you, Marshall Dove. Yes. Thank you, Marshall Dove. Uh, she's referring to uh, John's tribute to Monkey Vaughn. And there was a big press conference with some breaking news in Michael or Monkey Vaughn's case. Uh, that is a live that I did yesterday for those that aren't caught up on that case. We recommend that. Uh, to, to watch that. Um, Sue Taylor, this was a question asked a while ago, but I saved it. It's great. Question. How would the murderer come down from doing this? Would he be mentally high for hours or crash in a couple of hours? I'm going to continue Sue Taylor's question and ask, um, in addition to that, what, what about two weeks later? Here we are on week three. How do you know what? How does a murderer come down from doing this? So her question is: Would he be mentally high for hours, or crash in a couple of hours? Yeah, interesting question. I think for some murderers, I definitely think there's a thrill component. In fact, there's there's a famous quote from Dahmer that's similar to that, that Dahmer said something like, well, if I didn't kill, I'm not sure I will. This is a paraphrase. <laughs> so if I didn't kill, I'm not sure how I would have had the thrill or happiness, something like that. And it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think that the, I think there must've been a lot of adrenaline and cortisol during the, during the murder for sure. But so my guess is that physiologically it would have taken a while, maybe 12 hours to sort of deescalate, but maybe there's probably some degree of euphoria going on now in terms of getting away with murder so far and committing a crime that's being talked about internationally. And so I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a sad part of, somebody who would commit a crime like this, that they get a thrill from it. And maybe in this case, I could imagine that it would be a way of, in some ways, countering depression. One thing that we know about mass murderers and school shooters is that many of them suffer from depression and many of them are suicidal. 
So if, if we were to develop a profile here, I think you'd probably have to include that, that this person might have a history of depression and maybe some suicidal tendencies. And so carrying out a murder like this, that's so extreme, undoubtedly there'd be, I think, a lot of adrenaline and a lot of, you know, there'd be kind of a, a thrill that would dissipate fairly quickly, but it might, sadly, it might help with that person's depression for some time or a bit of time. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Cordy is saying there has been weird misogynistic messages left on Instagram accounts, stereotyping the girls. Somebody else asked, um, would you ever suspect a female? Why just a male? I feel like we've covered that a good amount, uh, between why, uh, if you have anything else you want to add to that, that's a question. And then, um, I think I have more questions about mass killers in general. You brought up You've brought up let me, let me just answer that question quickly, though. So yeah. most the I mean, if you're just looking at the statistically, most violent crimes are committed by males. And most and if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that almost the, the vast majority of violent crimes are committed by males under 35 years old. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that the majority of violent crimes are created by committed by males between the ages of 18 and 28 ish or 15 and 30, somewhere in there that, you know, younger men tend to commit more violent crimes. Age is a deterrent. So when I do evaluations, somebody who's older, who may have committed violent crimes when they were much younger is less risk. Why is that? I mean, there's, there's, there's probably a lot of whys there, but you know, one one would be, I think one would be a really simple explanation, which is that hormonally younger men have more testosterone. They're angrier and they're more likely to commit crimes. <laughs> they're more likely to act out, especially if they're not healthy. Right. Thank you. There was a great question that I am scrolling for. So forgive me to the person who, I can't find it. So forgive me to the person who uh, shared it I can't find it right now. Oh, and I don't know your name, but it was wonderful. Someone said, what do you feel, Dr. John, about the news covering true crime web sleuths? Some people and have been supportive. I think an example of that would be, you know, Ashley Banfield on News Nation has, um, you know, embraced this, you know, and and has said, you know, they they have solved crimes. Really, Gabby Petito's body was found because of, online sleuth. Um, but you shared uh, an article with me today where people are concerned about how it's affecting crimes. And this person specifically mentioned Good Morning America. I don't know if I've seen that particular article where they're saying this is not a good thing and they want to know your thoughts about this. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that in the right hands, crowdsourcing crimes is extremely powerful. And as you and I have learned, Lauren, in the last year, year and a half since we've been doing this, we've met some really smart people that are not professionals that, that do this on the side and they have tremendous insights and they have a lot of unique ideas about evidence and crimes. And so I, I think... I think for given the right people, I think it's incredibly powerful. I think that, I think that potentially, you know, that I, I wish, so I think police and law enforcement don't necessarily see it that way. And they don't really know what to do with uh, the internet, you know, the internet crowd, but I think they can be a tremendous resource. The downside is, however, that once you start getting into wild speculation and once you start to implicate suspects without evidence, which has happened multiple times on this case, then there's an ethical aspect, right? So I think as long as you, if, if you can <laughs> maintain some restraint and just try to look at the evidence and try to interpret what's in front of you and not make wild claims or wild speculation I think it's a really powerful way to to solve crimes. But when 
innocent people start getting hurt. And by the way, you and I know YouTubers that have done that. Um, without apology, by the way. So I don't know. When, when innocent people are accused of committing crimes that clearly they weren't involved with and they're identified as suspects, I wouldn't want to be them. That's extremely powerful and damaging and people can get hurt or killed. So that's the downside. I think that in the right hands, like so much in life in the right hands with the right people who have some moral compass that internet detectives and web sleuths or whatever we want to call them are amazing. And you and I have made a lot of friends in the, in the true crime community and there's some wonderful people and we would not want to trade that in for anything. So there's an upside and a downside, you know, the, the people on the unethical side and you and I know <laughs> not, you know, not to mention names, but you and I know that there's some creators out there that are, you know, definitely kind of on the edge with ethical stuff. So, um, it's sad. Yeah. I wish that, I wish that wasn't the case. I want to share a couple of things. You mentioned web sleuth. Web sleuth is actually our dear friend, Trisha Griffith. And she uh, does uh, work to have an ethical website and channel. Uh, we always say, uh, and, and then I want to, I, I agree with everything you just said there. I think it depends on people's motives. It's heartbreaking when people are not ethical, when people uh, accuse innocent people, when they bully, when they add um, speculation and rumors so extreme that it affects the investigation. But I do feel like um, the positives are positive. Again, Gabby Petito's body was found. If you watch the Netflix documentary, Don't F With Cats and what they discovered, they yeah. can be a force for good, but we have to choose to be a force for good and to be very careful. And I want to turn people to our friend uh, and fellow creator, Scientific Skeptic which is great because I actually think this week, by the way, Skep, as as, uh, as we call him, Skep uh, actually might have posted that he thinks all true crime channels should just disappear and the world would be a better place. <laughs> and here we are, a true crime channel. Was so he, was, he, was he referring to us too? Because I'm going to have to hopefully talk to Hopefully not. Him. Hopefully not. He, he refers to us as good actors. I'm like, oh, okay. yeah. you know, we're all still right. in his good graces. But what Scientific Skeptic does is he, he points out uh, some really – thoughtful well how about this he he shares some really thoughtful dialogue about how to find the good creators and versus the bad creators into here is a shout out to the scientific skeptics channel i think he is a force for good in trying to teach people the difference uh so there you go he's someone he, he refers to and them as I, bad actors and good actors i want to mention the thank you shelly shell i want to mention shelly shell as one of the good people that we've met over the last year too. And she's an example of someone who has incredible moral, moral compass and is really smart and has tremendous insights. And so I, I think by far the, the people we've met, the good people we've met and some of the friendships we've developed have far outweighed some of the negatives. And there have been negatives. Our, we had our YouTube account was hacked by another creator. We didn't know if we'd ever get it back. We've been slandered. we have I don't know. I could go on and on, but I, I don't want to focus on that stuff. We're just trying to do our own thing and, you know, keep the blinders on to some degree. Yeah. Shelly Shell, I want to share that we do know who Shelly Shell is. She's a hidden gem that we met through this wonderful true crime community. And I do know that this week she became a grandmother. So the best part about it is she is very young. She is much younger than me. <laughs> so my friend has become a grandmother. That's a reality check for me. <laughs> but congratulations, Shelly Shell. And we hope that you're doing well. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Lego Person 2 for their generous donation. We, we are so grateful for all of you. Uh, um, there are so many great questions here. Let me pull up this. Uh, and Dr. John. The, oh, go ahead. Yeah. You know, by the way, I want to talk about, so now that you, you mentioned, um, scientific skeptic, I should point out that profiling in general has come under a lot of criticism. So 
profiling is some people claim it's fairly scientific. A lot of people say it's not. I think the mix, the, the research on profiling is somewhat mixed that there's, there's some evidence indicating that profiling is not that effective. And so I think sometimes we, we fall sway to this whole mythology around profilers. We, I, at least for me, when I think of profiling, I think of silence of the lambs, <coughs> right? The movie with, with, Hannibal Lecter, played by Anthony Hopkins, and we and Clarice Starling, played by Jodie Foster. That I think we we tend to romanticize profilers as being larger than life and capable of solving every crime. And so I, I and and that's not true, by the way. There's a lot of profiling that's blatantly wrong, and there's a lot of profiling that identifies the wrong suspects and hurts people. So I think that needs to be pointed out too. Thank you. Whatever, whatever I'm saying here about a profile, by the way, is subject to change. So a profile also is always only a guide, right? It's, it's a guide to approach a case, to maybe do interviews. It's a guide that, that, that continually updates when new information becomes available. Well, this, is, this actually goes with the next question I was going to okay. ask. Also from Haley Manigold. Dr. Okay. John, is a suspect profile permissible in court? Or would it ever be used as evidence? So it's this is sort of what you're discussing. So I just want to throw yeah, that no, out no, there. It, there's, there's, no, it, it wouldn't meet the criteria to stand up in court. So uh, again, I think I think a profile is more. It's a map. It's it's so if if I were to develop, let's say I developed a detailed profile of my ideal suspect in this case, that might be used to for investigations that might be used when suspects are brought in for interviews. You know, you'd want to know potentially does this person fit some of those characteristics? It's just a way to dig deeper. So it's a roadmap that kind of takes you where hopefully closer to where you want to go, but you're continually updating it based on new information. Haley Manigold, hidden gems should now be called good actors (laughs) in lieu of scientific skeptic. And uh, thank you. Um, I'm so glad we found you to love this and love your blouse, Lauren. Where did you get it? TJ Maxx. And I do not know what brand it is, but you can write me later if you want me to find out. Thank you. Um, what else? Let's see. There have been so many great questions. Uh, Ozzy, Ozzy is saying we don't have fraternities or sororities in Australia. That is true. And are the groups friendly with each other? I think a good way to, yes, they can be very friendly with each other. I was at a college that had them, but there can also be competition. Uh, you know, rush is essentially choosing, uh, which sorority or fraternity you want to be a part of. I think it's like, um, and I don't know, maybe this is a United States thing too. Uh, you know, high school competition. You have friends that go to the other high schools. You go where you're supposed to go, but you play each other in football and there's competition and it's not always friendly. I think it depends on the college, the atmosphere, the people. I don't know if anyone else would agree or disagree with that, but. Um, right. Someone else think of it like team sports. Um. I did not check what Louisiana girl was asking before I posted her uh, donation. So thank you, Louisiana girl. She says, I adore your relationship. If you had any advice how to get there, I'd appreciate it. Sorry to go off on topic. Well, let's see. Um, There's there's on screen and there's off. (laughs) I don't I don't know what that means, but um, um, I I would say. Uh, per- persistence and luck. How about that? If you're having trouble finding the right person, just don't give up. Persist. You'll get there. And maybe a little luck would help too. But but keep going, Louisiana girl. Well said. John and I both had relationships that were hard before we met each other and we didn't give up hope. And we waited. And we found each other a bit later in life. And that's true. Don't give up. Don't give up and don't settle because you can find a doctor, babe. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's see. I'm just looking. Is there anything else you want to cover while I scan for some questions? There were so many good ones. And and if anybody had any questions earlier and I didn't ask them, feel free to post them again. This chat does go fast. 
Um, and then while uh, we wait for anyone that does want to ask any questions, is there anything else you'd like to cover, John? So I think, so let me just talk quickly about some of the characteristics of mass murderers. Fox and Levin are both criminologists who teach, I, I forget where they teach now, but they're in New York somewhere. They've identified five categories of mass murderers. They're, they've identified revenge killers, power killers, loyalty, profit, and terror. And I would say that in this particular case, revenge and power were probably, they would, would probably be the categories that would apply. And revenge and power typically go hand in hand, by the way. So um, I think, I think this was clearly about some type of revenge or some type of rejection. And the, the research on school shooters, by the way, who were a subcategory of mass shooters shows that, social rejection or rejection and humiliation often play, often play a really huge role in their behaviors. So I think there's probably some type of rejection going on here. There's probably some type of emasculation maybe that was threatening to the person, probably some type of humiliation. So that's what some of the research shows. And actually there was a, there's a book that came out last year called the violence project, which made a really unique that. So the violence, so the research was that they reached out to all of the mass murderers who were still alive. And there weren't a lot by the way. So most, most mass murderers actually ended up and end up killing themselves. So it's, it's very hard to research mass murderers because there aren't a lot of them left, but they reached out to the living ones and, most interestingly, they found that every single one of the mass murders that they talked to and that they researched had all experienced some type of childhood trauma. So they found that as being the commonality. And then there were, the triggers were, were different. The triggers could differ widely in terms of what actually led to the moment when they decided to murder, but they all shared trauma in common. And I, I think that's fascinating. Thank you. So, so putting this back in terms of the profile we're developing tonight, you, I think that's one of the things, if you're doing an interrogation of some of the suspects, you'd probably want to know. And in most cases, there was domestic violence in the home. So domestic violence would be also correlated potentially with misogyny. So you definitely want to look and see if one of the suspects grew up in a violent home and if there was domestic violence in that home and if there was some type of trauma going on. Okay. Um, a request to someone, Tom, I, I missed a question and a donation from Tom, a super chat. So a request to someone to, to resend that, uh, so that I can answer, um, Tom's question. Thank you, Tom, for pointing that out. There's been quite a few people, Tom, who are on Team Tom right now that have been writing me and saying <laughs> Tom's question, Tom's question. So I apologize <laughs> that I missed that. We, we'll get that asked. Um, uh, I, I think what Trina is asking is um, the profile difference between a person that was being targeted that we've discussed today and someone who was not targeted, like someone would you put that in the Ted Bundy category or, or I guess they're asking is what, what is the difference between someone that just absolutely picked the house at random? Yeah. It, so I, I mean the police, either way, the police have implied that there was some targeting that the, if it wasn't an individual in the house, then it was the house itself. So that, that would suggest to me that there was something about that house that meant something to someone like I said, sort of the sorority idea that the people in the house represented something to do with sororities. So I think the underlying motivations would be very similar, actually. The one would be very personal, I think. The other would probably be less personal, but so kind of the murder by proxy idea, still driven by the same types of motivations, which would be probably some type of revenge, some type of rejection, that type of thing. Okay. 
Tom, we got your question. Thank you. And I did see your original donation too. Thank you so much. He is surprised this person has uh, surprised that this person has not been noticed by friends or family, um, their physical or emotional demeanor. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. I think people in that community should be on the lookout for someone who's acting a little unusually. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what to expect from, from a murderer if they're still in that community. But definitely be on the lookout for someone who's gloating and sees this as a some type of accomplishment. I think it's possible that someone like that could talk about this at some point, you know, the, an Elliot Roger type person might be, might be quite willing to discuss what they did to see it as a, a type of trophy. Thank you. Brenda Fisher says that all she wants is um, a guy that likes true crime and dogs. So I hear you. I think that's what a lot of us were looking for. <laughs> so that's and I, th I think that's a big ask, Brenda. <laughs> I could see one or the other, but I think maybe most... you do. Maybe you do have to settle. Is that what you're saying? No, well, no, don't, no, don't settle. <laughs> it's just going to take a little more work. Yes. Hold out. I found one. I found one. We don't have a dog right now, but, but uh, I think we're working there's... on it because we have a five-year-old who's saying, get yourself a dog. So <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of, a lot of men who like dogs, the true crime thing. I'm not so sure about, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. QWERTY asks a great question and I, we do need to wrap up soon, but they, they ask what clues would the killer leave for police to say target or would this be based on a profile? I, I think that is a great question. The police are saying that they believe this is targeted and they're not sharing why. Uh, so, so did the killer leave clues or is it based on the profile that we're discussing that makes it seem like there was rage and anger uh, directed towards people or um, what the people represent. Uh, what would the clues be that would lead detectives to say this was targeted? So some of this would involve crime scene profiling and some would involve suspect based profiling, but let's think about the crime scene. And this, this is pure speculation because we don't know. We don't know all the details of the crime scene. We've been told, however, that, one of the victims was in worse shape than the other victims, right? So something like that might indicate that a specific person was more of a target. So if one of the victims was, uh, how can I put this? If one of the victims was, if their body was more muted or damaged more than some of the other victims, then perhaps that would indicate that they were the target. I know this is going to sound bizarre, but in the case, going back to Elliot Roger, I keep thinking of him as kind of an exemplar for this case. I mean, I think it's different than that, but in his manifesto, Roger talked about decapitating people. He wanted to decapitate some of the sorority women and then take their heads and like roll them into the sorority or something. I don't know. It was really bizarre, but, but, but my point remember, is that, YouTube, just remember <laughs> my yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. So uh, hopefully it's at the end though. Um, they'll miss it if they unless they stay to the end. Um, that if one of the bodies was more damaged, or if, for example, that happened, what I just mentioned happened to one of the bodies, then you'd have to. If it was different, if it was treated differently than the other victims, then you'd have to assume that perhaps the person had a different intent with that body, with that person. And so you, I think those types of elements in the crime scene, and again, I'm not saying those were present, but if you have those types of elements, then you're going to go towards seeing this as being more targeted towards one person. And you'd see the other victims as innocent bystanders who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that being said, Kathy, thank you so much. She says her son is in med school to become a psychiatrist. I have him watch Dr. John all the time for information. Gosh, that means so much, uh, to us. And, and I'll have, you know, my brother, John's brother-in-law is a psychiatrist. 
So we've, we've got mental health taken care of, luckily, in our family. We've got John, the psychologist, my brother, the psychiatrist, my sister-in-law, the therapist. Is that it? Is that and your, your brother? Your brother, by the way, doesn't watch us because he has no interest in true crime. So he's he's <laughs> well, I think it's his an work. example. Your son will probably not want to watch Dr. John soon because it'll become his life. <laughs> he's going to need a break from it. <laughs> your your brother's an example of why it's going to be an uphill uh, battle for Brenda. But hang, please hang in there, Brenda. <laughs> yes, we'll get you there. We'll get you there. Yes. Um, everyone, I'm, I, we are continuing to see so many great chats in, uh, and questions. I wish we could answer them all. And, and honestly, if, uh, we had the time we would, but, uh, we do need to run. Uh, thank you so much. Liz says Lauren is sometimes my therapist, Liz, I'd say that about you. And, and as you pointed out, I also need a labradoodle. So I, I need a little bit of uh, pet therapy too. <laughs> So John doesn't, John can take a break. <laughs> um, we are grateful for all of you. I think that's a great example of this community. We're all each other's therapists sometimes. And, and other times, maybe we are the reason people need therapists, but we try our best. Um, thank you everyone for being here. There were so many great questions. So we would love people to leave your thoughts in comments tonight. Tell us what you think, because this is our second live on this, on this, um, case and we hope to do another so share your questions and your comments and your thoughts in comp in not just the chat this is the chat live but in the comments below once this is over and we do read them all and for those that want additional bonus episodes and you can't get enough of dr john or you want to hear what he says when he's behind a paywall because that's when he really lets loose uh <laughs> <laughs> or he doesn't have to censor himself too much. Um, you can head to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash hidden true crime. No, but for really, for reals, what Patreon is, is it's a place where um, people can support us by, uh, you know, giving us a five, 10, $15 donation each month. But we, we, it's a place where we give back and we do bonus episodes and we have a wonderful community. So we'd appreciate Everyone find us there as well. All of our hidden gems are good actors. And um, again, to leave your leave your additional questions and thoughts in comments. Tell us what you think. And uh, if you didn't get your question asked, hopefully next time. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for all the kindness. And uh, until next week, thank you for this hidden hour. We'll see you next week, Friday. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hour. Uh -huh. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye.